Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryan out there. Jerry just left to go get some food. We're guessing at a buffet. Although probably not. Uh, I don't think she actually is going to a buffet, Chuck. I can actually hear Jerry laughing for the first time. I can too. I don't know if that's going to make it in the final (laughs) edit, but it was uh, creepy and otherworldly. Disembodied Jerry laugh. Kind of sinister. It's almost like we're in the same room again. Almost, man. Almost. Someday. Less than a year, I'm thinking. Less than a year. Yeah. Let's just call it that. And we're talking about hitting the road again, huh? Eventually. Yeah. I mean, if things go great, maybe next fall. But if they don't, then... uh, the next year. <laughs> we talk about stuff way early. Yeah, I mean, those theaters are going to be jamming. That's that's the, the big thought is that when things truly get better, everyone mm-hmm. and their bro- – people have never even performed live are going to book theaters to get up on yeah. stage. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of pent-up energy <clears throat> ready to be released right in our direction. You Boy, know? talk about an easy crowd, man. I can't wait for that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, uh, speaking of talking about things, Chuck, uh, great segue, because it turns out we're talking about something today, and specifically, we're talking about buffets. That's right. The do you old have good Jimmy Buffet. Do you have good, uh, I hadn't even thought about that. Good joke. <laughs> uh, do you have good memories of buffets from when you were a kid? Well, or I an mean, adult? we certainly went to buffets mm-hmm. uh, more than a little bit growing up. And it, it kind of jibed with everything um, that our household believed in, which was value for the dollar. <laughs> sure. Um, I learned from my dad that you should eat until you're physically uncomfortable and then okay. eat a little bit more. Oh, that's good. Didn't have good food uh, <laughs> examples from my dad. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, my mom has been known to stuff a roll or two in her purse. No. <laughs> sure, dude. She's She falls under the section titled Problematic Customers? Yeah, and I think, boy, I hope she didn't hear this. She's going to be so mad. But it was usually under the guise of like, well, I don't, I don't feel like I came in that hungry, so I didn't eat as much as I usually do. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, I'll make you feel a little bit better. My mom, uh, I don't think ever once in her entire life bought candy at a movie theater. She would oh, always sure. bring in those bag of bulk candies in her oversized giant 1980s purse. Yeah, yeah. And it was always great. Like, she always had the good candy. But, you know, if you wanted, like, snow caps or something, you Forget were SOL. Yeah. <laughs> I will say this. I haven't been to a buffet. I was really trying to figure out the last time. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, man. It Like, it literally may have been 20 years ago in Las Vegas or something, a, a town think, that yeah. I do not enjoy going to. Yeah. But I think maybe I can't think of any time I, I used to go to a this uh, sort of super Asian uh, buffet where when mm-hmm. my sister and her husband lived in North Carolina with them. Yep. And it was one of those weird ones that had like this great Chinese food, but then like pasta and seafood, and it was but not like in the in the Asian style of seafood. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's like, like fried like a cod typical, and stuff. That's a typical Chinese buffet. They have lots of Chinese food, but they have. Everything and they'll have like eight different buffets all in one. Is it like that? Uh, yeah, but actually, now I do remember the last time I went to a buffet, I did <laughs> go to one of those KFC buffets, mm-hmm. but it had to have been more than 15 years ago. Was it the one in Valdosta? That's the only one I know about. No, I, and I remember I literally went because I saw it on the sign said the buffet, and I was like, mm-hmm. I've heard of these, I gotta do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's still around. There's one on exit 18 on I-75 in Valdosta, Georgia. There's a bona fide KFC buffet. I can personally attest to its existence. When was the last time you went to a buffet? Uh, I I hadn't thought about it, and I was thinking about it while you were talking. Um, I was listening to you as well. But um, do you remember when we did that that, um, live catastrophe in Erie, Pennsylvania? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the next performed day, at a school in front of like 19 people? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And like 10 of them had to be there for like yeah. course credit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the uh, the next day, so there's uh, airplanes fly in and out of Erie a couple of times a week. And um, the, uh, the, 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 
flight that I happened to have didn't leave till late the next afternoon. So I went and saw, um, oh, Cure for Wellness, I think, was the movie I saw in the theater. And then I went and ate at one of their local buffets in Erie. So you stayed on an extra day, huh? An extra two-thirds of a day. Very, very long two-thirds of a day. Interesting. I think I drove and flew out of another town. You did, did. You did. And I, had, I didn't have that foresight. <laughs> but, um, but before that, I have to say one of my favorite buffets that I, I went to sometimes was uh, Panahar. Do you remember Panahar over on Buford Highway? Sure. Yeah, the yeah. late Panahar. It just shut down, I believe, in the last few months. I don't think I ever went there. Was it Indian Buffet? It was Bangladeshi, okay. um, you, you know, like the average uh, um, American would just be like, oh, good Indian food. But it was just magical. There was something that they put in the food that made everything really good, but they would do a lunch buffet and it was fantastic. I bet you would pay for that, though. I would pay a lot, especially now that it's gone under. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see what you mean. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, they had very good food. It was well-made, too. It didn't just taste good. It was like well, well-made. Like they had some... 150-year-old grandmother back in the kitchen overseeing things. Yeah, well, I don't mean that it would be made bad, but it, I, Indian food is the love and bane of my existence. I love it so oh, much. Is that right? But it, it, never it gets tears to me, me up. That bad. Yeah, it doesn't get to me that bad. But that's uh, that's part and parcel with buffets, though, Chuck. It might not just be Indian food. It could just be the fact that it's a buffet because buffets make you super-duper sick. All right. So should we talk about the smorgasbord? Yeah, because that's where the whole thing originated. Yeah, I, was, I did not know the origin of that word, so it's kind of cool. In Scandinavia, in the 13th century, they had smorgasbords, but it was uh, smorgasbords and brandvinsbords. Mm-hmm. And it sounds a little more like if you were to put out like a nice meat and cheese tray with some butter and spreads, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a little smoked fish. But the key here is vodka on that brandvinsbord. Right. So that's what everybody was there for. But they would lay out these spreads for, like, travelers who came to visit, guests who came over long distances, and they'd be like, here, restore yourself with these. lovely. You know, this spread of light food. And uh, over time, the Swedes said, you know, this is a really great idea. Let's just make this the meal. So from what I can tell, it began as the Bronvins board and then later became the smorgasbord. And in addition to the fact that it was, like, this awesome spread of great food that everybody loved. Um, the aristocracy liked the fact that um, the the uh, the staff would just be attending to the smorgasbord, that it wouldn't be waiting on the guests. So if you kind of wanted more privacy or whatever at your dinner party, a smorgasbord was the way to go. Yeah, that makes sense. Keep them out of our hair, tend mm-hmm. to the food. I think uh, it was a little more of a refined experience than just go like stuff your face with everything. Yeah, that's that's still a big difference between a Swedish smorgasbord and an American buffet. Yeah, like very well laid out on like a round table in a specific order that's not necessarily just an order to make you fill up on cheap food first, which we'll get to right. later. But uh, yeah, it sounds kind of cool. And then in the 1912 Stockholm Olympic Games, mm-hmm. I think the rest of the world saw the smorgasbord and was like, we need to bring a little piece of that back home to the good old USA. Yeah, they're like, you serve yourself from a table in the same room where you sit down and eat. This is amazing. And there is something amazing about it that I still, <laughs> despite researching and writing this whole thing, I cannot put my finger on what it is. But there's just something about buffets or smorgasbords, right? So yeah. something did capture the world's attention at that 1912 Olympics. And then in America in particular, the smorgasbord really got a boost at the 1939 World's Fair Um, that's the one where that big globe is over in Flushing, Queens, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, So at that one, there was a Swedish pavilion, and they had a restaurant there called the Three Crowns Restaurant, and they put out a a real deal smorgasbord, and uh, the Americans just went bonkers for it. And as a matter of fact, they said, just give us a couple of years. We're going to figure out how to turn this into basically the most American thing anyone's ever invented in the history of food service. (laughs) Right. So uh, from there, we moved to Las Vegas, which is, you know, you can't talk about buffets without talking about Vegas, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, early, early on what would become the Las Vegas Strip before uh, Benny Siegel even was dreaming of the Flamingo. uh, Bugsy, Bugsy Siegel, right? Yeah, Benny's is his real name. Bugsy was. I was wondering that the way you said it, I've been correcting you lately and just 
putting my foot in my mouth every time. <laughs> so I came at it a, a little more trepidatiously than before. Have De- you seen- definitely more trepidatiously <laughs> than the Sacagawea correction. Uh, did you get the uh, the supercut of that from the basically exact same conversation we already had years before? No, I did see people mention it. Um, yeah, someone it spliced the Lewis it together. <laughs> really <funny. Yeah. laughs> I gotta hear that. Please, will you forward that to me? I gotta. I don't yeah, know I'll have to dig it up. <laughs> it was good stuff. I want to give him his due too. Okay. Uh, so Herb McDonald was this guy's name. He was a publicist, and he was kind of one of the very first people to to start working on what would become the Vegas Strip. Mm-hmm. And he's given credit as the guy that came up with the uh, at his El Rancho Vegas or I guess where he worked at the El Rancho, uh, which is the first hotel there on the Strip, what would become the the Las Vegas Buffet. Yeah, the legend has it that one night in the late 40s, he was um, hungry, and he went to the kitchen and came back with a bunch of cold cuts and cheese and just kind of laid them out to make himself a sandwich. And some of the gamblers who were there late at night were like, hey, I'm kind of hungry. Can I get some of that? And he thought, huh, this is not a bad idea. If I lay out some food... That isn't a sit-down meal that the gamblers can serve themselves. They're going to spend more time here gambling. So maybe I will create what's now known as the American Buffet in Las Vegas. The cheap, all-you-can-eat, 24-hour buffet had its origins from that little eureka moment. Yeah, the Midnight Chuck Wagon was the name of the de- the first deal, I guess, at $1.25. Mm-hmm. And they became known for the uh, 24-hour version, which was the Buckaroo Buffet. I love that. Which was a buck. It was a dollar, the Buckaroo, of course. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's, everyone kind of knows the history of Vegas and, like, cheap food, ch- cheap or free food and cheaper free drinks and fairly cheaper free rooms. That was sort of the old days. Mm-hmm. It's not a cheap, cheap town to visit these days. No. I think they still run a lot of deals and stuff like that because sure. gambling is where they make, you know, where they want to make most of their money. But they did wise up at some point and they were like, hey, listen, we're not just going to keep giving away steak dinners and stuff. Well, people started coming for the shows and stuff like that and weren't necessarily gambling. Time yeah. was if you went Family. to Vegas, you went and emptied your pockets there so they could afford to lose money on like the buffet or whatever. But the the the... the Vegas all all you can eat all night buffet that started in the late 40s and became synonymous with the town actually kind of lent uh, a bit of um <clears throat> cachet to uh buffets in general in in the United States as we'll see like they kind of spread from there it started in in Scandinavia moved to the World's Fair in 1939 then to Vegas and then from Vegas it just kind of spread like um mm-hmm. like a sp- Spider web of, <laughs> I don't know, of like uh, Apple turnover all emote. Okay, yeah, I thought you were going to say something like a five gallon pan of hollandaise sauce. Oh, that that is so much better than what I said. Man, that was that was amazing, <laughs> Chuck. All right, let's take a break, and we're going to dive into the golden age. We love golden ages. The golden age of the buffet. Right after this. Okay, so there's uh, long been in America restaurants that have been like all you can eat blank for blank amount of money. Yeah, we used to do that uh, some. Sure. I mean, like, did you ever eat at Buffalo's Cafe for wings? Oh, no. Did they have an all you can eat? Yeah. Of but it was. Did. It was like all you can eat wings for like say eight or nine or ten dollars or whatever, right? Yeah, we That's, went to a place called Rio Vista on Memorial Drive, which was uh-huh. it was like all you can eat catfish on Tuesday nights, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that's still very much around, and that apparently is where the whole the whole idea behind buffets finds its other footing, its other origin in the United States was this these kind of deals that were meant to kind of generate new business. Like you would go try out a restaurant. Um, there's this really great site called Restauranting Through History. Ooh. Terrible name, but a great site. And um, the person who runs the site found this. Uh, ad for uh, the city restaurant in El- Elira, Ohio. Yeah, from 1896, and it was all you can eat oyster stew for 25 cents. So it had been <laughs> around for a little while. <laughs> but when the Depression rolled around, 
all of a sudden, people were like, oh, all you can eat sounds kind of good because I haven't eaten in a week and a half. And I've got this whole family who's starving, too. So let's go try this. And they did. Yeah, that surprised me. I was surprised to see them turn up in the Depression uh, just because of value and stuff. But, you know, food prices were low. So mm-hmm. I guess they could afford to charge people 50 or 60 cents or something. Yeah. Uh, for all they, well, not all they care to eat. That wasn't really a thing yet, but people did love it. And apparently um, desserts during the Depression era buffets was really where they, because um, I guess that was just a rare a rare treat. So they would really load up on the sweets. Yeah, they, def- they definitely would. But it, it taught people who ran restaurants, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you order people or if you offer people you know, whatever, all they can eat of something. Like some people do like overindulge, but a lot of people just eat like a normal amount, which is weird. And that kind of gave this like um, confidence, I guess, to restaurateurs to kind of start to move into the like changing their restaurant entirely over to an all you can eat setup. Yeah. So, you know, we go now to the 50s and 60s where legit chains started opening that were, you know, very cheap or, you know, let's just say inexpensive buffets. Mm -hmm. And this is where you start to see, um, you know, mac and cheese and carb heavy meals and fried chicken and salads like jello, you know, the little kind of festive looking jello mold salads that you're not quite sure what's inside. Mm -hmm. And then uh, chain said, you know what, this smorgasbord word is kind of weird. Like, I don't think they were using the word buffet at all at that point, were they? I I'd started around the same time in like the 50s or 60s. Okay. But they were using smorgasbord sometimes or smorgy or other variations like smorget or smorga. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and this is when uh, they kind of started leaning away from uh, the, these nice round tables of food to the long sort of cattle style <laughs> right. gra- grazing. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, like I said, that Vegas buffets kind of gave buffets everywhere else in the United States this kind of cachet. And part of that was presentation. And then as more and more chains kind of grew and, and took over the whole buffet style food, um, yeah, they, they did away with the presentation part really quick and just said, like, eat your slop, you know? Sure. It was more about that. They'd shove you into line, that kind of thing. Yeah. But the, the idea, um, uh, like you said, uh, smorgasbord was kind of taking off. It seems to have been like out west and in the Midwest smorgies and all that. But then elsewhere, buffets started to, to come to be used. So by about the 50s or the 60s, you had smorgies and buffets proliferating across the United States like uh, a pan of apple turnover a la mode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that word buffet, you know, comes from the, the furniture piece, the French furniture piece for like, uh, we call them sideboards sometimes. It's what yeah. we have a couple in our house from Emily's grandparents. Um, but people call those buffets as well. We and call them bedspreads. Beds- <laughs> <laughs> I call them comforters. <laughs> yeah. Or Afghan. Remember those growing up? Did you have Afghans yeah. in the house? Yeah. Yeah. They were always too small. It was like, why'd you make this? It's also the why'd itchiest you, way you to keep warm. Why'd you stop making this? <laughs> the itchiest way to keep warm of all time, probably, besides mm-hmm. like a wool blanket. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not big on Afghans. I like things to be bigger than that. So and softer. I don't know about small Afghans. What was going on there? I, I They they were always just slightly too small. So like they Afghans. Couldn't, wouldn't cover from chin to foot? No, no, never. Never has there been an Afghan that is covered from chin to foot successfully. Even if you do the little diagonal trick? Uh, yes, I've even tried that. And then it's like <laughs> too short on the sides. So like my love handles uh, will be cold. Oh, no. Get at that. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that I remember growing up with is what comes next, which was um, actually a lot of these, but the Western Steakhouse mm-hmm. sort of buffet, which was actually one of them was started by Dan Blocker, of who played Haas Cartwright on Bonanza. He mm-hmm. started the Ponderosa Steakhouse, which I must have known that back then because we went to Ponderosa's and Bonanza was the, yeah. big, one, the big one that we went to. Uh, Ponderosa was the buffet I grew up with, too, up in Toledo. Yeah, I love those yeah. Bonanzas. It's sort of, I mean, the same company, right? 
Yeah, as far as I know, I'm not sure what the difference was. We didn't have a Bonanza. Like I said, it was just Toledo, but um, we did have that Ponderosa. It was wonderful. What about Sizzler? Sizzler we didn't have, but I was aware. You know, when you think of like the steakhouse theme buffet, you were Sizzler aware. That comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, I was Sizzler aware. We, I don't um, think we, we ever went to Sizzler. Those. That seemed like a cut above, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah, I think it always, at, at the very least, positioned itself, if not, was actually a cut above. There's also one called Chuckarama never that I never it. heard of. And then Golden Corral, everybody knows about. Um, it's been around since the 70s, and, and Golden Corral is like the last man standing, from what I can tell. It's actually doing rather well. I think there is still one over by the uh, North of Cab Mall, if I'm not mistaken. Dude, they're everywhere. They're still building them now. Yeah, well, but they're not everywhere around where I live. I got gotcha. you. Know what what I mean? about, did, did you ever go to Western Sicily? Because oh, it was, wait, yeah. <laughs> sure. oh, really? It was established in Augusta, so I would guess you, you had been there before. Yeah, I went to Western Sicily, and then the other big ones, uh, and they are, in fact, next on the list, or when they went sort of uh, farmy homespun, mm-hmm. um, there was an old country buffet near where I lived, and there were also hometown buffets, uh, Ryan's Grill, uh, and then Bakery and Buffet, all owned by Ovation Brands, which mm-hmm. was just pumping out garbage food to buffets all over the country. Right. Yeah, Yumi said that the worst case of food poisoning she ever had was the first time she ever tried a buffet, and it was Orion's. Oh, really? And she just, uh, she can't even say that word. Like, she can't even be friends with somebody named Ryan now because <laughs> she'll just get sick at the thought of it. Oh, man. She can't even watch Ryan Gosling or Ryan Reynolds movies. <laughs> no, no, I have to call her, I have to call him Gosling if I call him anything else. <laughs> uh, I like and was a big fan, and we as a family as well, of the, um, of I guess ethnic buffets with we didn't do many Mexican ones, but there were definitely Mexic well, there was definitely one we went to sometimes on Sunday morning that had I think it was kind of even before they started calling things brunch. Mm-hmm. But uh I can't remember the name of it, but it had a really nice taco station and they would make you f- like a fajita station and that stuff was so good. Where you don't remember the name of it? No man, I can't remember the name. I don't think it was Poncho's. I don't think it was a chain. I gotcha. We uh, we went to Chi-Chi's when I was a kid. I don't remember being a buffet, strangely. I don't, I don't know why. But I didn't know it, it was either. Yeah, I, that's where I was introduced to the chimichanga. Oh, God, the best I, thing. I love to eat and I love <laughs> yeah. to say. But Chi-Chi's was like the olive garden of Mexican restaurants. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I didn't really go to those that much. Um, but we did go to Mongolian Barbecue. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the 80s, there was one, another on Memorial Drive uh, near where I live that, you know, that's where you pick out all your, and I can't imagine the health codes because they literally had like raw meat that you would pick out yeah, and then hand to a person to cook. Yeah, with your just your ba- your, hair, your bare hands cuffed, <laughs> Man. filled with, with raw meat. It was so good, though. There's a chain called Hu Hut. It's a Mongolian grill. It's like make your own stir fry buffet. And they um, just, uh, they're newcomers. They've been around for about 20 years. And they're actually doing rather well as far as buffets are going. Well, good for them. Um, there's also this the little bit of history that I found on that restauranting through history site, um, Jan Whitaker's site. Um, she turned up a couple of gems that I just thought are, you have to mention. Um, it's like that whole smorgasbord thing when people were trying to figure out how to Americanize it. Um, there was a, a hilarious collision between ethnicities when like uh, an Asian proprietor took over like a smorgasbord or opened a smorgasbord oh, yeah. where you would have like Gong Lee's smorgie. <laughs> Or Johnny Hom's Chuck Wagon Hofbrau and Smorgi. That's great. I, I just love that. I think that's the cutest thing ever. I'll bet Johnny Hom and Gongli were very happy, welcoming gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, pizza buffets was something we did a lot as well. Uh, there was one called Village Inn Pizza near us, and I guess it was could be akin to like a Shakey's, who I think is kind of the king yeah. of the uh, of the pizza buffet. But boy, those pizza buffets! Yeah, I remember it was like. Like, you always had a plan at any buffet, like a game plan. You didn't just, like, casually eat. You, like, <laughs> right. you had a game plan. But those yeah. pizza buffets, I remember people sitting around in the restaurant with, like, yeah. one eye on when they're bringing those pies out. And it was yeah, just like oh, yeah. people would attack it. They would swarm, swarm. Yeah. Yeah, Pizza Hut's had uh, buffets for a very long time, and they still do from what I understand. But those, it's the dessert pizzas that are, like, the bomb. 
Yeah. Uh, I think keep pizza buffets going. And there was um, always the sad pizza, too, that no one wanted that just sat and sat. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're looking for a pizza buffet, they have CC's now. They're kind of all over the place. I don't Although need was, a pizza buffet. <laughs> there's this, I think we all need a pizza buffet once in a while, Chuck. But there is this um, site called Mashed, mm-hmm. uh, which I hadn't heard of, but they had a lot of good stuff that I ran across for this article. Um, but they were rating buffets, and the, they got to CC's, and they said, do you like eating cardboard? No? Then stay away from CC's. <laughs> I was you, like, that's mean. The funny thing is now as an adult, like, I go to New York, and, like, I'll grab a slice, and that is the meal. All right. And not like, I would like nine more of these, <laughs> right. and then a dessert one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's nice. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, but it, every once in a while, it's, I don't know, just going berserk on food is kind of, <laughs> there's something about it. Maybe that's the thing that I couldn't put my finger on. Going berserk on food is yeah. the allure of, of buffets. Uh, I liked this. In high school, my hack for school lunch was the salad buffet. Mm-hmm. Well, it actually wasn't a buffet, but it was a build-your-own salad that you might as well have, you know, you didn't need to go back. Because I would, I would build these huge salads just stacked with, like, ham and turkey and cheese mm-hmm. and bacon bits and mm-hmm. very little lettuce was going on in there, croutons, and then drench it with ranch dressing. And that was a really good value at my high school cafeteria. That's awesome. Yeah, once you drench, drench it with ranch, it's it's like, goodbye, nutritional value. Hello, love. <laughs> but salad buffets were really big in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, they were. You know, people were trying to eat a little better. And so I think in 1978, the two big salad buffet um, competitors, Super Salad and Soup Plantation, and Soup Plantation also was known as Sweet Tomatoes for a while, they were both founded in 78, and they had a pretty good run up until the 90s. And then people were like, I don't think this is actually very healthy. And they said it's never been. And yeah. uh, they, they started to kind of go away little by little. My favorite name of all time of those style of restaurants, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember Lettuce Surprise You. Yes. <laughs> I, yes, they were good. I uh, I loved Lettuce Surprise You, actually, too. All of those, Super Salad, Soup Plantation, I mean, like, they're, I like the idea behind them, but they're, you know, not, not actually healthy. No, of course not. It's, it's uh, like I said, my salad was probably worse for you or worse for me than <laughs> whatever was in the regular lunch. A Big Mac. And speaking of Big Macs, it turns out, Chuck, I read this really great article on, oh, I can't remember, maybe Eater, but it was like this the, the history of fast food buffets. And there's like this whole subculture where all they want to do is talk about fast food buffets. That's it. Yeah. And there's like legendary ones that may or may not have existed, like McDonald's supposedly had a buffet for a little while or um, Taco Bell. But the impression that I have is that that might have been like a local um, uh, franchisee trying something out. Gone it wasn't mad. necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Just completely lost their S and they're like serving, <laughs> serving McDonald's or Taco Bell buffet style. Well, I was a Wendy's Super Bar adherent. Yeah. Uh, I think I've told the story before. For newspaper staff, you were allowed to check out and go, quote, unquote, sell ads or take pictures or whatever. Mm-hmm. So all the newspaper staff would always hit the Super Bar near the high school mm-hmm. and eat pasta and a little Mexican uh, taco salad. Yeah. And my favorite thing was they, they used, I don't even remember, they used their – Hamburger buns is the bread, and they would griddle those hamburger buns. Yeah, it's garlic bread. Yeah, it was so good. It really was, yeah, because, like, their their stuff was legit. Like, even their little salad bar was good, but they had, like, a baked potato bar, and uh-huh. the whole thing was, and it was, like, three bucks or something like that. Although the, the key here is it was not all you can eat. And from what I gather, that was one of the downfalls of the Wendy's oh, Super was it Bar. Not? I don't believe it was. I believe you just got it was to go supposed through to be once? one one big fat trip, much as you could fit. Um, <laughs> that explains that's, a lot. <laughs> that was that's my memory, though. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And I also saw somewhere that that was one of the reasons why it went away is because they just had so much trouble keeping people from going back for seconds or thirds or whatever. That also explains now what looking back why I always had. Uh, pasta and enchilada sauce in a baked potato. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Because you're like, where can I put this? Right. <laughs> oh, there. There we go. You want to take a, one more break and then come back and talk about how buffets make any money at all? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
We'll be right back. Okay, Chuck, so there's this thing, like the fact that if if you're a Las Vegas buffet and you're offering things for cheap, you're actually losing money, it kind of shows you, it points out that buffets have a really narrow profit margin. Apparently, restaurants have, you know, one of the narrowest profit margins of any industry, but then the buffets are the narrowest of the narrow. Like, they really have trouble making money. And so um, there's actually a an entire... Uh, economic theory called adverse selection that predicts that buffets just shouldn't exist, and yet they do in the face of economic theory. Yeah, so this is interesting. Adverse selection basically is uh, if you have a case where a buyer has more information than the seller does, Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be in a distinct advantage as the buyer. So the seller is going to set their price at a price point that's uh, low enough to attract the worst customer they can get and high <laughs> enough to not uh, to high enough to chase away the really good customer, which I guess in this case would be a really heavy eater. So the, the good customer to the buffet oh, well, is sure. a low capacity. Yeah. The eater. low capacity eater. And it basically means you're, you're not going to be in business very long. Yeah. Because you're going to set your price high enough that, um, the low capacity eater is going to be like, this isn't worth it. I don't eat enough to justify paying this. Yeah, but you're, it's going to be low enough so that a high capacity eater with a huge empty belly is going to say, oh, that's a great value. So you're going to attract nothing but high capacity eaters, and your your yeah your business is just going to go away. And yet buffets still manage to persist despite that very logical economic theory predicting that they shouldn't. And it turns out that when you start digging around in the business of buffets that there's a lot of, like, tricks that they use that you don't find elsewhere in the restaurant industry to kind of protect that very razor-thin profit margin any way they possibly can. Yeah, and, you know, obviously if you're looking at a buffet and how they made or make money, um, the family unit is a really big deal because, and I know it's it's very sort of lazy and reductive to paint it in such a uh, kind of a king of Queensian way, but... (laughs) <laughs> That's how buffet runners uh, and managers and restaurateurs looked at it was you've got this big hoss of a father that's like, I need to eat at a buffet tonight. And this like diminutive little wife that's just like, well, I don't eat very much. And the kids are like, well, I love the dessert. So the only one in that family is uh, that's really putting a hurting on the buffet is is the dad. Yeah, uh, Kevin James. It, Kevin James. And again, this is not how we look at things. It is super lazy. But if you're talking about the buffet industry, that's exactly how they looked at it. Yeah, I mean, like all of those cliches about like, oh, gosh, here comes a, f- a football team or something like that. That's that's actually like part of the buffet industry. They worry about stuff like oh, that. Oh, totally. Right? Yeah. So um, some ways that they they try to to balance out that or find that balance between low capacity and high capacity eaters um, or to to kind of protect their their profit margin in the face of, you know, more high capacity eaters than low capacity eaters. In one way, they'll just straight up kind of fly in the face of established all you can eat ethos, Uh which is all you can eat, no strings attached. Um, And some restaurants say, you know what? No, we're not going to do that. Um, We're going to basically use nudge uh, nudge psychology to kind of get you to to um, not be wasteful, to be a little more mindful. Because that's kind of part and parcel with going to a buffet is being like, I don't have to use my brain f- at all for the next hour that I'm going to this buffet. And so they'll, they'll try to do things like um, – They'll say, like, take all you want, eat all you take is a very common sign you'll see. And in fact, Chuck, um, I mentioned this uh, this restaurant called Grandpa's down in Cocoa, Florida. Mm-hmm. It's a it's in a train, which is just mm-hmm. that in and of itself is worth going to, right? But they have a salad bar, and on their salad bar, it has a sign that says if if you waste food or if the waiter or server determines you have wasted food from your trip to the salad bar, you haven't eaten enough. Um, you'll be charged $2. There's a $2 charge for wasting food from the salad bar. And I can't tell you how many um, 
arguments you, me, and I have seen between like old couples about <laughs> whether or not that they're going to get charged that two dollars because the the husband or the wife didn't eat enough of the salad from the salad bar. Well, you know how that ends. <laughs> it's it's like as if buffets weren't gluttonous enough. That ends right. with some old man saying, "Oh yeah, watch this." Yeah, <laughs> like fine. Shoving whatever food is on that plate down his throat right in front That's of the manager. Right. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Other fine. places do that too. I've heard of plenty of places when I was a kid that supposedly, like the rumor is, I, I don't think I ever saw it happen, but they would charge you for wasted food. Yeah, I don't know if they actually do. I think it's, I think it's just a threat. An, yeah, it, you know, it's kind of like a mandatory <laughs> mask policy. They're not going to put you in jail for not wearing a mask, but the fact that it exists is going to make more people go ahead and do it than otherwise would. Uh, yeah, another trick they um, will lay on you is to not clear your plates away uh, because I guess they there is real research that says that people are um, not prone to go up for more food if there's like three sort of half-eaten dirty plates sitting in, sitting in front of them. I guess the, the shame accumulation keeps them from yeah. going back. Yeah, that's happened to me. I realize I've been a target of that kind of harassment now that I've done this research. <laughs> Are you okay? I had no idea, and now I'm uh -huh. a little bitter about it. <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier about front-loading it with carbs, uh -huh. and that is true. They have done studies that show that, um, I think, uh, Cornell University, I don't know why they did this, but they Well, they have a, a huge like food like food industry program. Oh, there. okay. Well, They're like the, sense, the national leader in it. All right. Well, I'm glad you said that because I thought it was a strange thing to study. But 75% mm -hmm. uh, of people in a, in a buffet line, they found, got the first thing in the line no matter what it was. And mm -hmm. so the idea is that you put like, if it's a, a Chinese buffet, that's where you would put the fried rice. Mm -hmm. Or old country buffet is that's where you'd put the mashed potatoes and gravy maybe. Yeah. And, you know, you want them to fill up on that stuff. And by the time they get to the the real high dollar amount, which is like the bagged beef mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we're going to talk about in a minute, that you're not as hungry. Yeah, they, that same study, I believe, found that two thirds of the stuff that, that is on the plate uh, after you've made you know your rounds on the buffet were the first things that you encountered. Like you just go up and you start behaving in this really predictable way. So, you know, buffets protect their, their bottom line by catering to that. Um, they also, like if you've ever noticed um, when you go to a buffet, it's like five ninety nine, But then when you go to check out, it's like ten ninety nine because your Coke, your fountain Coke was $5. Yeah. Um, that fountain Coke costs them next to nothing. So to make $5 on it is a really good way to boost their profits where they're otherwise losing it, you know, hemorrhaging money. That's why we drink water. Yeah, so I've read some stuff about um, people getting kicked out of buffets, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, some buffets are like, we don't serve tap water. Like, sorry, yeah. you have to pay for, your, for a drink no matter what it is. Uh, they also have to watch their price point with um, pricing it too low mm -hmm. so that people don't think they're eating garbage food. So uh, they've done studies on that. And a pizza buffet uh, for $4, uh, I think people who paid the $4 considered the food 11% uh, less good or desirable than people that paid literally twice as much, paid $8, even though the food was the same. Yeah, double-digit difference. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess I might as well say it here. I worked on a, a job as a food stylist, not as the food stylist, but when you're a PA, sometimes they would just say, hey, food styling needs you for this whole job. Just go be one of them. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a job on a an unnamed major chain, um, you know, sort of one of those bar restaurants is all I'll say. And okay. literally every single thing on the menu comes bagged and a, most of it comes pre-cooked. Yeah, that's why like a lot of restaurants will say uh, we're a scratch kitchen because yeah. they're saying like we don't use Cisco. Like we actually use so ingredients gross, that you would use at home. But yeah, the, so many restaurants just use Cisco or some other food service where all that stuff is pre-cooked by Cisco and it just shows up in bags and your job as the cook is to put it together and heat it up and then that's what you do. That's yeah. actually one way that buffets save money is by not having to employ actual chefs or cooks and they also have to employ far fewer wait staff because, you know, they're just coming over to make sure your drink is refilled or something like that. They, they need way fewer people because you're serving 
serving yourself, which saves them money. And then there's one other trick uh, that kind of falls in a little bit with the, um, the, you know, take all you want, eat all you take kind of sign. Yeah. And apparently Sizzler led the charge on this, that whole all you can eat uh, idea. If you stop and think about it, it sounds a lot like a challenge yeah, it's a dare. to some, like, <laughs> you know, the reptilian part of your brain uh-huh. takes it that way. Watch this. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And so Sizzler said, well, we're going to change that to all you care to eat, which is much more genteel and is much less of a, it's much less hostile or aggressive sounding. Yeah. Um, and it never took off, obviously, but you can still see that every once in a while. You'll see For it sure. on like a, a buffet sign or something like that. And you're like, oh, that's a fancy buffet. Yeah, there's another place here. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I think Jason's Deli. Mm-hmm. That I think they've got like a salad bar and a dessert bar, but you yes. also order uh, sort of the main portion of your meal. And like soup yes. and salad and dessert can That's come right. with it though, right? Yeah, and it's so good. I love Jason's Deli. Is it good stuff? It is. I mean, it's a it's a big honking salad bar and soft serve ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, and swirl. Yeah. <laughs> um, they have they have this really great look, kind of like um, molasses bread. Like uh, it's it's really good, Chuck. You should go check it out. That's and good their sandwiches well. and soups are pretty good too. All right. Um, so problem customers, you know, we've talked about uh, people that would stuff food in there, you know, like they would come <laughs> in with like the ziplocs ready to go inside the purse. Yeah. Uh, or they have like special plastic pouches in their coats. Uh, in Britain, um, there were people at this one place, a buffet called Gobi, in Brighton, in Britain. Uh, they were banned for life in 2012, and they made the news. They're like, you, you can't come back here anymore. They did. Um, and I read this uh, this Business Insider article where this person was like, oh, man, you know, I wonder how easy it is to get kicked out of a, a buffet. So they went to a different buffet called Mr. Woo's, and um, they said they tried so hard to get kicked out and um, just eating and eating and eating that they were basically crawling out when they finally left. And they finally asked the manager, like, what do you have to do to get kicked out? And the Mr. Boo manager was like, we would never kick anybody out. It says all you can eat. You know, you eat as much as you like. And uh, they were like, okay, I wish I would have. I wish I would have <laughs> gone to a different place <laughs> to try to get kicked out because it sounded like they really paid the price for it. Uh, I also like the story in uh, from the Chuckarama when in 2004, a couple that was on Atkins were kicked out because they went to the carving station 12 times and they were just loading up on meat and they were like, you can't do it. That's the most expensive thing here. Get out. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the restaurant was like they had to issue a statement because apparently right. the position was we're a buffet, but we're not all you can eat. And that's like basically a contradiction in terms. You have no business owning a buffet if it's not all you can eat, you know? Yeah. Look it up. So, um, and that's actually a pretty fairly routine thing. Like, you can get kicked out of a buffet pretty easily. And if it's particularly egregious, you're, you're banned for life. Um, I'm realizing now that Yumi has a lot of buffet stories for somebody who doesn't like buffets. <laughs> but um, she lived in Japan for a while. And she and our friend Raimi, uh, who she met there, um, he uh, is a big strapping dude. And he actually got, I believe, banned from a uh, Japanese sushi buffet because he would show up and like this this poor couple who owned mm. this restaurant would just be like, please, please, sir, no, please stop going back to get more food. But I could uh, do some damage at a sushi buffet for sure. Yes, yes, yeah, I could too. Uh, so now the dark side of buffets. I mean, a lot of this has been dark, yet we're I'm salivating somehow still. Yeah. Uh, our buffets gross is how you titled this next section. And the one sentence you have is, that answer is resounding yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's, it's gross. You know, you, when you're sharing utensils, uh, your, your food or your body germs are going to be all over that. When mm-hmm. that, that, those tongs fall in the, in, the, in the meat and gravy and mm-hmm. the guy behind you just picks them right on up and they maybe wipes them off of the paper napkin. Mm-hmm. Like who, who, who calls someone over and says, sir, the tongs fell in here. That's what you're advised to do if you you're are a patron to. of a buffet. That's what you're supposed to do. If there's tongs in the in the food, that food is toast. It should not be served anymore because Mr. Poop Hands, who just touched the tongs last and just threw it into the stir-fried beef, has now corrupted the entire pan of stir-fried beef. But it's you don't problem. want to wait on the stir-fried beef, so you just get it I'm and wipe you, it off dude. and you I'm use it. You. It's I gross. mean, that's why, that's why buffet patrons tend to be more rugged <laughs> than the average uh, restaurant goer. 
uh, it's also gross because that food is just sitting out there for a long time sometimes. You no, know, it's as dangerous. It's dangerous. They try to do what they can with ice and, and chafing dishes and steamer tables. But, you know, let's get real. Some of that stuff is well out of the required temperature range. Yeah, that, and so that range is 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And anything in that 100-degree window um, – is is fair game for things like E. coli and Shigella and Salmonella to grow. And apparently, uh, the most prolific bacteria can double in population size in 20 minutes within that temperature range. So it's, I mean, it's actually, it, it's not just gross, it's kind of da- dangerous. Like, if you read, I mean, these don't get published very frequently beyond, like, local areas. So you would have to do some research. But if you just look up... Um, you know, food poisoning and buffets on Google, you're going to find that it happens a lot because you're going to be able to search a bunch of small town and cities papers uh, all at once. And it seems like it happens quite a bit. And that's why. Yeah. uh, We all need to pay. uh, We all owe a debt to Johnny Garneau. He is the restaurateur uh, and germaphobe who in 1959 patented the sneeze guard. It was known as the food service table at the time. But those sneeze guards, uh, they went from not there at all to there everywhere and required by law now over the course of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. I remember by the time we were kids, they were pretty much in play unless you went to maybe one out, you know, if you went to a buffet that was a little more rural area, it might be kind of wide open. But I remember there usually always being sneeze guards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely like law now. Um, speaking of law, by the way, I forgot to mention with those um, utensils, the shared utensils that buffet patrons serve themselves with, there's no law regarding how long those can stay out and how long they have oh, to God. be, um, or how often they have to be replaced, by the way. Yeah, it does not surprise me. So, um, yeah, God bless Johnny Garneau, who was like, this is just gross, but this is the business I'm in, so let me try to improve it however I can. And he came up with the sneeze guard. Uh, food waste is obviously a big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are an Ovation brand, a big, big company with lots of uh, buffets, they, I think they um, filed for bankruptcy in 2016, but they had 330 buffets uh, nationwide. They had real computer modeling and data uh, data-driven uh, insight into mm-hmm. exactly what to bring out and when to bring it out and how to really cut down on that food waste because that's that's a big cost for them. Not only is it just wasteful and terrible to throw right. big pans of food away, but that's, like you said, the margins are so thin, they have to do everything they can, uh, including computer modeling, to really see if they can get that down to the very, uh, I guess, minimum amount. Yeah, and, like, they had it down to a science, man. Like, they they knew to the store, like, based on that location's data, what food they should put out at what time and in what amounts to try to cut down on food waste (laughs) as much as possible, which is pretty impressive. But despite that, they still found that between 5 and 25% of every pan of food, including apple pie a la mode, was going to waste. Um, And there's just nothing they could do about it. And from what I could tell, that doesn't take into account the waste that was um, being sloughed off of, like, the customer plates who took all they wanted but did not eat all they took it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of those phone calls about this computer modeling, you know, and like restaurant <laughs> managers arguing with corporate. <laughs> right. I'm telling right. you, Frank, Buffalo doesn't move Salisbury steak after two. They just don't. Stop putting <laughs> it out. Just face it. <laughs> I love it when people say face it. Face it. <laughs> yeah. Face it. They can't move Salisbury steak, Frank. Uh, so some places are allowed and some communities are allowed to uh, pick up this food for people who need food. But, you know, I think that's probably kind of rare, sadly. We we talked about that in that Why Is That Dude in That Dumpster episode yeah. about gleaning. Um, but there are communities that definitely allow gleaning, but there's some that expressly prohibit it, which is sad because that is a lot of wasted food. And food on um, the plate that the patrons don't eat. That's wasted as well. Like yeah, truly suppose- wasted. Supposedly, two hotel buffets are um, the uh, 
champs of food waste for not just buffets, but the entire restaurant industry. They they throw out about 50% of all the food they put out on any given day, Oof. which is just shameful. But the, the silver lining of the whole thing is, is you don't have to worry about this food waste for much longer because buffets probably won't be <laughs> around that long. Or if they do, it's going to be in very limited, small amounts. Because like you said, um, that Ovation Brands, that was the leader of the industry for a while, they went bankrupt. Right yeah. now it's Golden Corral, but Golden Corral's up against the wall because not just restaurants are in trouble, but buffets were specifically singled out by the CDC guidelines as saying these should probably shut down until the pandemic is over because they are COVID nightmares as far as restaurants are concerned. I think Golden Corral would be up against the fence, no? I guess so. <laughs> They'd be up against the barbed wire. Yeah, I mean, people are eating healthier these days. Millennials are certainly not, unless there's, I'm sure there's an ironic millennial that loves a good buffet, but sure. generally that's not their bag. Uh, even baby boomers, which was a big part of the buffet generation, are eating healthier as they age. Uh, you know, they don't they don't want to die. So everyone's trying to do a little better, and and it's been narrowed down to, you know, sort of the local mom and pops. You know what? I, I have gone... My dad lives up in the mountains, mm -hmm. and I've gone to the mom and pop buffet there within the last like twelve years. Now that I nice. remember, that's awesome. But there are those, good? and then uh, sure, it's great. Okay, <laughs> and that that stuff is cooked. Like that's like grandma's fried chicken and like the real deal. Yeah, it's not bagged yeah, food. I love that. No, um, but yeah, they are. I mean, they're gonna. They're not. Uh, the salad bar will be around. There'll oh, always yeah. be buffets yeah, yeah. probably on cruise ships, and there'll be some in casinos. The best buffet I, I ever had was in Vegas uh, with Yumi. It was a breakfast buffet, and they had a no-joke um, a donut making station where they made donuts in front of you. It was oh. like I can I can still like imagine myself there right now. Happiest day of my life. Like little the little uh, fryer. Yeah, it was so good, dude. It was so good. But they also had frosting, too. It wasn't just like, here's some cinnamon sugar on it. It was, yeah, they were yeah. amazing donuts. But um, so there's there's always going to be like buffets here or there. But the idea of just buffets being everywhere, their heyday is over and they're definitely going the way of the dinosaur. Face it. And I, face it. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's sad because I think the kids are going to miss out on a, a an experience because it's kids who enjoy buffets. You know what I mean? Kids love them, man. That that swirled ice cream that'll it, that tastes like acid rain will never get old. Yeah, and I I mean the what the one of the things you can say about buffets that will lose is this ability to try new things. You know, like you don't you don't risk it all on ordering something that's your entree and then you, it's terrible and you just wasted an entree. Like yeah. you can go try stuff at a buffet. Like I tried frog legs when I was a kid at a buffet at a dinner um, a dinner theater that we used to go to. I probably never would have tried frog legs <laughs> in my entire life had it not been for that buffet. So there's something to be lost with buffets, it's true. I think I might have tried frog legs, and I don't know if you ever went to this place, but my final plug, it's not open anymore, so it's a worthless plug, but Athens, Georgia had a place called Charlie Williams Pinecrest Lodge. Oh, yes, I remember the Pinecrest Lodge. That was out, I guess, somewhere on the east side. It wasn't, like, close to campus or anything. Right. And that's that was a really kind of, quote-unquote, nice buffet where, like, that's where the parents <laughs> would right. always take the kids when they were in town. Right. You wore your jeans without the holes in them to that. <laughs> yeah, I think they had frog Sunday. legs there. <laughs> yeah. So that's it on frog legs, right? You got anything else? No. I'm going to, I feel like I owe it to myself to check out a buffet at some point soon. Well, not soon, but like next year. Yeah, after the pandemic passes yeah. for sure, <laughs> if there's any left. Right. Uh, well, uh, since we talked about the pandemic passing, everybody, that means, of course, it's time for listener mail. Uh, let me see. I got a few good ones here. I'm going to call this Changed Life. Uh, Kia Ora, guys. I'm writing because an, uh, an episode of your podcast helped me discover my life's passion and dream career 10 years ago. Uh, I was a science-obsessed 12-year-old listen to, listening to Stuff You Should Know frequently, and the episode that changed everything was how molecular gastronomy works. Remember that one? Yeah, that's a strange life-changing one. Uh, Go on. The concept of breaking down a food to its molecular basis and reconstructing it into something uh, unrecognizable from a sensory level blew my mind. You planted a concept in my head that inspired me ever since. Uh, that year I did a presentation on H-E-R-V-E. Uh, 
What is that? Hervé Villachez? <laughs> no. I don't know what that is. I don't either. Oh, her- say oh no, wait. Herve this. H-E-V-R-E this. I don't know what okay. that is. It uh, sounds t- like it's a play on Curb This starring maybe. Hervé Villachez. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had this presentation uh, for my class. I saved up until I like, uh, could afford a kit of food activities the following year. As fortune had it, a school teacher informed me that the m- more practical version of molecular gastronomy is food technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, through a science fair, I was linked with a group of mentors with the New Zealand Institute of Food Science no. and Technology through the ages of 14 to 16. Uh, my early networking from six years prior helped me secure an amazing first internship at one of New Zealand's largest food manufacturers this summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still get giddy with excitement I felt from that episode every day from studying non-Newtonian fluid mechanics to experimenting with new stabilizers. A single episode has led me down a STEM path that I wouldn't have discovered otherwise, yet suits me completely. Man, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Uh, The the gift of knowing what I am meant to do early on has pulled me through severe mental and physical illness. I'm not sure I would have continued to pursue a field in STEM had I uh, not known what was waiting for me. I think about how you guys change my life often. I'm sorry for not letting you know sooner. That's okay. <laughs> uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for pointing me in the direction of food technology. It is an invisible yet highly important undercoat of modern life that I would have never known without you. And that is from Kizzy. Man, Kizzy, thank you. That was an amazing email. That's That, Chuck, is exactly why we take every topic as seriously as the last, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, you never know who what it's going to mean to somebody. And, like, even if we're like, oh, that, that was kind of interesting, there's somebody like Kizzy out there who's like, well, that episode just changed my life. So congratulations, Kizzy, on figuring out what you want to do in life so early. Best of luck and best wishes, and thank you very much for letting us know that. That was great. You never know. The next great buffeteer might be listening to this very episode. <laughs> right. Very nice. Uh, well, if you want to get in touch with us like Kizzy did, or you think you're America's next great buffeteer, we want to hear from you. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.